Thank you very much for inviting me to share our experience. Obviously, we don't have all the answers to these questions, still being investigated extensively. But, but Papillon has a long experience, and, and obviously we follow that, you know. And, and watch and wait is not for every patient. We need to understand that. I'm sure you fully appreciate that. So let me just share the slides, and then we'll go through some case scenarios, and then we'll, we'll, we'll give you some data. I have no conflict of interest to declare it. Apart from the fact that we have two PhD students from Horizon 2020 who's doing a lot of research for Papillon with me. If you look at the standard of care for rectal cancer, we can divide them roughly into three groups. You could say the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is what uh, Lars Paman, my mentor, always uh, uh, talked about. But you can say a good, the intermediate, and the bad, uh, the, the, the advanced group. So that's another uh, nomenclature you can use. So only for these, the ugly, the advanced group, there's a role for chemo radiation, and all oncologists around the world will agree with that. And the surgeons will, will agree with that as well. So as soon as you see this involved CRM, and then uh, lots of lymph nodes, uh, advanced stage primary tumor, usually the size more than three centimeter, they go for chemo radiation, and then they would consider surgery. At what point you do surgery is always debatable, but over the years we, we've emerged to say that you wait a little bit longer because we, before we would just do surgery straight away at six weeks and then it moved to eight weeks and 10 weeks and so on. And now they're waiting for up to about four months now. Whether you wait th three months or four months, it's, it's not an issue. But during that time, you will see some of them, not a lot, some of them, I would say less than 10%, will achieve a clinical complete response with no residual tumor that you could see or feel, and all the lymph nodes just disappeared. And that is a group I want you to just think about it. I'm not saying that this is a group you must do contact, you must do uh, watch and wait. I'm just saying that by chance you can get this uh, a good, very good response in a small number of patients in this very ugly advanced stage tumors. The tumors that we are very keen to, to advocate, watch and wait for patients who are not keen on surgery or a stoma, or they're not fit for surgery, then the OPERA, the randomized trial, looked at this middle group, the intermediate group, up to T3, A and B, some lymph nodes, but not uh, more than two or three, so size could be up to five centimeter, but they have to be CRM negative. But the, the group we left out is T1s, and T1s do very well with, with whichever we do, either contact alone or local excision or whatever. And this is a, a bit more controversial group. So let's concentrate on the middle group. Let me take you through the story with one of these gentlemen. Uh, my prize patient, who was 79 in 2009, and he had rectal bleeding. He had a scope, and that shows a tumor, as you can see here. And then MRI scan staged this as T3, so that means going out into the bowel, mesorectal, uh, going out into the mesorectal fat. And then there were a lot of lymph nodes there. So in the MDG, like you were doing, I had an MDG at at Southport, where this gentleman was. And then I raised my hand and said, well, that, that's to chemo radiation, and everybody agrees. And then six weeks later, he had a scan. And then we look at the scan. At that time, I can't show you the big pictures, but you, you have to believe me that there was hardly anything you could see on the MRI. And then the young surgeon said, OK, he's coming this afternoon. I, I will propose an operation for him. So we went off for lunch. And then after lunch, I had a frantic phone call from this young surgeon. Sonny, this guy got cancer and he wants to go skiing. So I said, have you scoped him? And he said, no. So I went across the room and then scoped the patient together. So when we actually scoped him, there was hardly anything to see. But when you actually put your finger, you can feel something underneath. So obviously, not all the tumor has gone. So I said to the gentleman, you go skiing next week. Uh, when you come back, I want to do some contact radiation. 
And he said, I don't care what you do so long as I don't have a bag. I don't want a bag because I, I go skiing twice a year. And in fact, this was in Switzerland, actually, uh, one of your hills he, he was skiing. He goes twice a year uh, around this area to ski. So when you are faced with patients like that, the MDT recommendation was to go for a B resection when there's a residual tumor. But they, all these recommendations are based on various guidelines and published evidence. And MTT don't usually think too much about um, uh, the, the contact radiation or organ preservation. They have to do what is best for the patient that they consider is best for the patient, not what the patient choose or what they want. So this is where, where the gray area is. And I'm very pleased that you started to think about organ preservation for some of your patients. And the dilemma is what to do when the older patient who is very fit refuse surgery as he doesn't want a stoma. We've got to think of other innovative ways to solve this problem because the dogma, the gold standard of care is still surgery and they need to understand that. Provided the patient understand that, but they want to try alternatives, this is where you come and you have to explain it and very important to document this carefully. But there are a lot of patients who prefer to have a box because they were told that if you don't have surgery, they're going to be dead. And they, they say, yeah, I don't, let me die, but I don't want a stoma. Or there are other, with all these you know, medical uh, problems like rheumatoid arthritis, unable to cope with the stoma. Uh, and then you have to think of alternative. Sorry, was, was there a question or just a comment? No, no, no. no, no. Okay, I'll carry on. So then there are patients like my gentleman, who we call Don, he's a retired lecturer actually from university, uh, saying that I don't want your surgery. There is a data from Professor Simon Bach, who some of you may know, surgeons may know, and this is his 1,000 patients. When you look at patients above the age of 80, the mortality after eight hours of surgery, uh, and we're talking about TME surgery, is about 14%. There's a lot of data from, from UK as well as elsewhere. And if they are above the age of 90, the 30-day the mortality is 25%. And we've now got one year and two year data to say that these figures actually double. So there is a mortality issue you need to think of trying to treat this early T1, T2 tumors with major surgery. And then you have lots of these comorbidities. Usually these have got one or two or three comorbidities and sometimes they are quite overweight patients. You don't see that very many in Switzerland, but in UK there are plenty of these old folks who are grossly overweight. And you've got to think of how to get through this apron, you know, to get your stoma out. And they didn't manage to get it out, you know somehow. But important thing is, all these countries, I'm sure you will, you will be doing this National Bowel Cancer Screening Program with, uh, with, the, with the FIT test and, and, and uh, FlexiScope and so on. The idea of doing these national uh, cancer screening is to pick up early stage cancers. And the, uh, the, the UK data is predicting that you should pick up at least um, uh, half of these patients in Jukes A, where you can cure majority of these patients, because we were seeing at one point 20% of Jukes D with liver meds and lung meds through bowel screening, they were predicting that you'll see a lot of early tumors. And this is no longer a dream, it's a reality now. This is the bowel screening in Liverpool, Professor Utu share his data. And we're seeing a lot of these polyp cancers. When we get this polyp cancer, you can't go on and do a B resection. And this was done in the past in good faith to say that the best treatment for rectal cancer is a B resection. And there's a lot of variation between different hospitals. I'm not going to go through which hospital, but some of them are doing up to 50%, some are doing less than 10%. But the reality is when they do the AP resection for these very early tumor, 32%, a third of them has Duke's A carcinomas. So obviously this is not appropriate treatment in this day and age for early small tumors to do an AP resection. I would like to take you through a second case, an extreme other age of 
youngest patient, 31 year. He's still my youngest patient. He was a managing, managing director working for a firm, his own firm from London. He was diagnosed with the low rectal cancer. They did a CT scan. This is nearly 20 years ago. And then they said, oh, you, you have chemo radiation, and then we'll have to do a, a B resection. That would mean a permanent stoma. So this young guy was not happy, and he requested a second opinion. When we were asked that this young guy, 31-year-old, wanted a second opinion, I said, we don't do 31. Usually what, what we do is the elderly patients, you know, 80 or 90, who we give second opinion to, but not to the youngsters. You have to go for an operation. He said, no, 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 after chemo radiation, they're going to do, give it back, and I don't want that. So he came up to see us, and that was his tumor. I said, this is too big. I can't do papillon on that. He said, no, 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 I'm having chemo radiation at St. Bartholomew Hospital next week. Will you see us, see us be before uh, they do anything? So I said, normally you go for surgery and you have to accept that. And he said, no, they were going to give me a stoma. I will not accept this. So reluctantly, I look at the surgeon, he looked at me and we said, okay, we'll have a look. So when he actually came back, there was hardly anything left, you know. There was a little bit you can feel uh, in the middle, like the same um, we had with this first case. I said to him, we will give him contact and he can actually see when I scoped, when we scoped him and said, can you do contact? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do contacts. I'll, I'll take two contacts on that. And I said, we'll have to remove it and see what's left in there. So my, my friend, some of you may know, Mike Hirschman, he was with uh, Gerhard's Buse. He learned all these TAMS techniques. Usually it's for benign tumors, but they started doing it for malignant. And he's the second or third case that we did TAMS on in the country. And that's a TAMS apparatus. I won't spend time describing it because some of you are surgeons in the, in the audience. So what he did was remove quite a big chunk of tissue. And then, you know, he got a good thickness, a full thickness. And when the pathologist had a look, there was hardly any tumor left, the legs of Mucin, and there was no residual tumor. He is still alive. He got married two years ago. He's now 52. And in, with a good quality of life, that's my second case saved by this local excision with the proof that there was no residual tumor. Do we need to do it on everyone? The answer is no, but for special cases you do, and we can discuss it later. He wrote a book called Saving My Ass, and some of you may have seen, I think Christina has got a, a copy, or if you don't, I think he's, it's very popular, so you know he's trying to get the fourth edition printed now. But what he said in his last edition was, Cancer journey is not just about surviving, but we need a good quality of life after surviving. And that's what he tries to do. I was asked to present at the ESCO meeting in, in a GI ESCO meeting in San Francisco uh, last year. And we had a trial called Opera, which was published. And then they were saying, what happened to the patients who, who didn't respond or who had a recurrence? And I presented my data at the ASCO meeting. And this is available online, by the way, so you can have a look at that. And what that shows was in the, we did, we don't always do TME surgery in all of them. And we do offer a lot of local excision. The French surgeons are very keen on that. The British surgeons are not so keen. I'm not so sure in, in Switzerland how your views are, but we can discuss that. But luckily for, for this eight patient in arm A, and two patients and arm B, there was no residual tumor similar to this, my second case. So we've got to bear in mind, although there may, you may think that there's a residual tumor, pathologically there's no residual tumor and you've got to think about local excision as an option. So this has been published and I can uh, uh, forward these uh, papers to, to, uh, to Gina uh, to put on your uh, uh, blackboard. And then you know you can easily uh, easily uh, get this uh, really online. So I'm moving on to third case. They want me to talk about recurrences. So this is a 40 year old chap uh, from Northeast with rectal bleeding, and then uh, he had a colonoscope in uh, well nearly 10 years ago. And this is what we found. Bit similar to your case, very low down, and there is this tumor there right uh, on the dentate line, histology, adenocarcinoma, and it was a 27 millimeter tumor. 
about the uh, anal rectal junction at crossing across the anal rectal junction. It was T2, very similar case actually. But the patient was very keen to avoid APR. And then because he wanted to get married, and there was this nice lady who was keen, and he was keen to preserve the sexual function. In fact, he refused external beam. Uh, uh, and I, was, I wasn't sure what to do with that. So what we did was we just started with contact radiation because this tumor was quite small. The tumor did respond quite well up, after um, three shots of tumor. There was still a little bit of residual at three months, but at six months, the whole tumor disappeared. So I was happy, he was happy, everybody was happy. And then 18 months later, there was this appearance. So that is a regrowth. This is clinical complete response, but you could do get regrowths. And that, when they do occur, that will occur within a year to 18 months. And that's what hap that happened. So what we did was uh, Mike Hirschman, my surgeon, did terms on that. And then there was residual tumor and it was R1 resection and he refused the completion surgery. So we didn't know what to do with, with this. So what, in the end, after a lot of discuss, heated discussion, he agreed for external beam chemo radiotherapy. And he remained well, he, he had a scar, a TEM scar, and we discharged him last year. He's still alive and well, 10 years later. So that was the recurrence that was salvaged by local excision. And then in our randomized trial opera, we looked at this local recurrence, and usually, as you can see, in arm A, which is just external beam alone, arm B with the contact radiation boost, the first year data in the opera trial, and when there is a contact radiation boost, you, you get local regrowth of about 15%. And, and in the external beam chemo radiation alone, you get nearly double. And then at four years, these figures moved. And again, it's still uh, almost double. And by, by, by this uh, four year here, it becomes fairly static. And then obviously you see the data on, on the surgical salvage of these recurrences, what happened. So 38% versus uh, 18%. Just to remind you very quickly on OPERA trial, this is for tumors T2, T3, A and B, less than five centimeter. They're randomized to arm A, which is external beam chemo radiotherapy with external beam boost nine gray, which is what Christina and all the sensible radiotherapists around the world will do. And this is what we call Habagama regime, that we always joke that, you know, arm A is Habagama. And then arm B is same external beam, chemo radiation, 45 and 25 gray, but with the papillon boost of three fraction, 30, 30, and 30 every two weeks. And then we see what happened initially at 14 weeks. So this is what will interest you. When do you assess them first? And this is usually three months. We do an MRI scan, we scope them, and when you're not quite sure what's going on, then we would scope them again six weeks later. And then we do another MRI three months down the line, and then we do a scope again at six months. And at that point, you have to make a decision. If the tumor disappeared, we just watch them. If there is a small residual and you see the data on the local excision that we did, and if there's a lot of tumor left, they go for GMA surgery. I'm not going to share the TME data with you today in, in the interest of time. So what the OPERA trial showed is, if you add contact radiation together with the external beam chemo radiotherapy, the organ preservation rate at three years is over 80% as opposed to 60 if you just have chemo radiation. But if you look at the tumor less than three centimeter, organ preservation rate at three years is 97% versus 63%. And we've now got the data for five years. And unofficially, I will say that the, the, the figures have dropped down to just over, uh, just under 90. And this has dropped down to under uh, 56 now. And that will be published next year. Why is contact effective in this situa situation? When you increase the dose, normally they would give 45 gray or 50 grays, and then add another six gray or 10 gray. And then the, the, the responses get higher. 
But then as you increase the dose, the response gets higher and higher. But nobody will, in the sensible mind will give more than 60 degree external beam because you get a lot of toxicity. So we're adding on top of 45 gray, another 90 gray. And then you can see this curve that was generated by a very clever physicist called Anna Apple, who's now working in Leeds now, to see that you, you can see the response goes up quite high. And she, she calculated that you need minimum of 92 gray to achieve half these patients sterilized. So there's no way you can deliver 92 degree with external beam radiation. The final case, another one who was in opera and he was a T2 tumor and we gave him contact radiation and then he had an external beam. And then what happened was he had an ulcer and that persisted for nearly a year. We weren't quite sure what's going on here. So we wanted to make sure that we don't miss the boat in case there is a regrowth. And there's always a race edge in the corner, which always worries me. And then something popped up here, eight, 30 months after contact. And I thought to myself, this must be a recurrence. And the surgeon, very sensible guy said, no, no, it's just soft. I'll try and remove this. And he did remove it. And it was just a, a villous adenoma, no malignancy. But you can still see this ulcer there. And the reason why you see the ulcer is the surgeons, when they see this ulcer, they have to do a biopsy to try and uh, see what is there. And you can see uh, when you do that after high dose radiation, the, the ulcer persists and it doesn't heal properly. And we can't really call this a complete clinical response because there's a persistent of ulceration. So we call them near complete response. And this is something you'll see. But if you don't do biopsies, you can see a nice pale scar like that. You see some telangiectasia, which can bleed sometimes, not always, but if they are on uh, uh, anticoagulants or, or nowadays you have uh, all these um, uh, new agents, oral agents, they tend to bleed a bit more. And then in 10% of our cases, we would need to do argon beam to try and seal these, and that stops the bleeding. Usually the bleeding stops after about 18 months to a year. And this is due to the telangiectasia caused by radiation. This is one of my paintings, for those who don't know, and Christina knows this. So this is one of my paintings that was used in the, in, in the American Oncology Journal in 2014. This is a, a, a picture from Burma where, where I originally come from. Now, I want you to read this. And th with the permission of Matthew and Joyce, I just got that last week. And he was so thankful. Your machine is a great success in Holland. They now got two machines now in, in Netherlands, one in Amsterdam, one in Eindhoven. This is where this gentleman come from. And he was actually on the table that the, the Harm Rutan, some of you may know, was going to operate. And then at, at GA, the tumor was moving so freely. Ham said to, to himself, this must be a T1 tumor. I can't operate on this chap because he doesn't really want it. I forced him to agree for surgery. And he did. So he, he, he rang me, actually, while this patient was asleep. Sonny, could you do contact on this chap? So I said, yeah, but he has to come over to Liverpool. Oh, yeah, yeah, he will come. So he wake him up and he told him about this. So they came over a week later and then I treated him. I'm not going to show you all the pictures. He's now nearly 10 years out and he's alive and well, still driving the taxi in the, mo in the daytime. In, in evening time, he sings and they entertain beautiful wife who will also sing. And they were saying that he met a lot of these customers and obviously, they, they've now got uh, two machines, so they, they've come across five customers. And he was thanking me for saving these young people from a stoma back for the rest of their life. And he said, I will never forget. So this makes you feel good when you see this sort of thing happening and people appreciating what you do for them. So take home message is a plan organ preservation. You need to plan it beforehand before you even start the treatment, your MDD is a good point to start. You should start with contact if the tumor is less than three centimeters and patients will not gain on major surgery. 
or a stoma. And that's been shown in the OPRA trial to have the best result, 97% versus 63. For larger tumors like your gentle uh, patient, you start with external chemo radiation. And if they respond better, then you can do contact radiation for the residual tumor if they're less than three centimeters. Usually they are. But there are a few, you know, we have to go for TME because they're, they're not uh, suitable. An OPERA phase three randomized trial has shown that if there are any local failures, either immediate local failures with persistent disease or regrowth after um, uh, waiting for six months or more, then you can do salvage surgery without compromising the chance of cure. I thank you for your attention. So just to make clear, you said you got to do the first uh, assessment after three months after uh, radiotherapy. Uh, would you still calculate these times stiff or do you calculate these times differently if there has been an additional chemotherapy uh, phase after the radiotherapy? So do you do your first assessment after radio chemotherapy or radiotherapy, or do you say if there was a systemic component added after the radio chemotherapy, we do this later because uh, there are still some kind of treatment also uh, going to the tumor. Or do you still think it's after radiotherapy, the three months you have to assess? So if you do a TNT approach, it might be, you know, that you have systemic therapy still after radiotherapy. Uh, yes, uh, but because that was exactly what uh, Abagama did. So what she did was to give some just ordinary 5 of you um, during the time we're waiting. And now the modern thinking is we give more and more aggressive chemo uh, with, with this uh, TNT approach, you see. So people who, who have more aggressive tumor, younger patient with EMVI like this, your patient, we would give chemo, and that's a time, we don't want to waste the time. So we will be assessing while they are having chemo at three months. So usually they finish, whole cycle will finish by three months, and you assess it as a first phase. So it's a continuing assessment, not just one stop assessment. It's just an evolution of what's happening to that scar, what's happening to that ulcer. If it is healing, you just masterly inactivity, as my professor would say, not doing anything on that scar or, 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 the, uh, or the ulcer. And then you, you make a final decision at six months. So we would get carry on observing during the treatment in the first phase. But obviously for very early stage tumors, you won't do TNT, but for middle and the later groups, you know, there's a, there's a vogue to, to do more chemo and, 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 and then, you know, give as much as you can before, because the risk of metastatic disease is high in this patient. But in our experience with opera for the intermediate groups, the risk of distant death is less than 10%. So we don't tend to give any adjuvant chemo or new adjuvant chemo to any of our patients. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes, yes, I think that's that's clear. So you take as the important point the end of radiotherapy, the local therapy to assess after three months. And if there is still additional chemotherapy, you would not consider this to be calculated uh, or, or you know, yes, not no. to be calculated for the three months after the end of therapy. So the after the end of therapy is after the end of radiotherapy or the local therapy. But that's that's clear. And you said the assessments, the important assessments are after three months and after six months. And you do the assessments by MRI, uh, yeah. by it's digital. Right. You, do, you don't, so what do you do with the assessment? You do MRI, you do endoscopy, and you do digital rectal at the finger, no. correct? No. But you don't do any biopsies, correct? No. Never. No, but well, not never, because like in my 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 last case, we had a recurrence. When you can see something that is growing, you can take biopsies. Obviously, you need to have a definitive diagnosis before you offer him surgery. Okay, but if so it's a flat scar or or just an ulcer, we we don't recommend doing biopsies. Okay, biopsies only if you see something growing. Like growing right. through the, from the oh, nucleus. Okay, okay. Uh, something mountain, mountaining up. So something uh, rising up from, from the tumor, where formerly the tumor was. So, okay, so that's that's also a clear statement. And you think we you have to do the MRI and the endoscopy and the thing. And these are the three things you do at your regular reassessments. Okay. That's correct, yeah. And then it's a triple assessment. And there's a rock curve, which I haven't shown you today, 
So if you combine the three the information from three modalities, you get a better uh, 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 assessment. Do I just doing MRI, like some people are relying on that, or just doing endoscopy? Most of the recurrences are endoluminal. I would say 80% are endoluminal. So uh, in fact, you know, uh, I would rely less on MRI because MRI, you still see edema and some abnormalities before it all settles down. And this is something that we're doing for opera trial as well with working with uh, Regina Beaton uh, to look at this uh, regression, how it regressed, how quickly it regressed and so on, whether that correlate with the initial uh, eventual outcomes. So digital examination is also very important. So it has to be by a trained person, the same person doing it is better or a, or, or, a, or a team who's doing it is better because you need to see the evolving, uh, resolving or evolving lesion. And if, if different peoples are doing it, you can't. So if you're going to set up a watch and wait uh, group, which, which I would encourage you to do one or two surgeons, one or two radiation oncologists, other can join in as a learning because it's a learning curve for everything really. And then the first two years is most important. Majority of the recurrences are in the first year. And then some can still recur at second year. After third year, the, the recurrences rate goes down like in, in this curve that I showed you. So we would do quite intensive um, uh, MRI in the first two years. We don't do a lot of CT scans because we don't see distant meds that many, it's less than 10. So we'll do one at six months and then 12 months and then 24 months. So it's less CT um, and more MR. And then again, MRs, we're just thinking of trying to reduce the frequency to four months in the second year. Uh, we don't want to drop the frequency to four months in the first year, but but my research fellows are looking at that MUA uh, it's looking at this uh, data and we, we're going to combine with the other centers who presented this uh, data, how the, the recurrences were detected, usually intraluminal, so through the endoscopy, which is very, very important. We still do that every three months for the first two years. Okay, so if you have a regrowth which you detect during the first two years, it seems to be very rare that you have a metastasis at the same time. This is a little bit counterintuitive, and I know you already stated that this is apparently a rare event, but this is still the thing which is in a way criticized uh, and which you know keeps it a little bit away from this approach because we think if there's a tumor regrowing, some of these patients do during that process, which happens in the first two years, do will make metastases, and that's the patients we're gonna lose. Is this such a rare event? Or and, is this? Yes, so I can't tell you exact figures on how many have local and distance at the same time. And I will try and get that for you because I've got the raw data actually. I can find that out for you. But it is not common because usually the local regrowth is on its own and you get distant match separate actually. But there are combined uh, local regrowth and, 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 and distant meds. Maybe uh, Nua in the audience, uh, she's looking at some of this actually. Nua, can you answer that question? Uh, so, so, sorry, please. Uh, sorry, can you please re repeat your questions, please? Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the question was, when there's a local recurrence, do you always yeah. see distant metastases? And I said, no, you don't always see distant metastases. Some of them local recurrence on its own. Some of them are local and distant, and some of them are distance on its own. So she's looking at 600 patients, actually. I don't know whether you had a chance uh, to answer yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I have been doing on that. So I can share the data soon after I finish my analysis. So I'm doing on that too, yeah. Okay, okay. So so we yeah. one one way invite us again, I I will try and share that for you. Uh, yeah. she's going to publish it anyway. So we will yeah, that, yeah. that's yeah. for us a very important question because it really is what keeps 
doctors a way yes. to oh, night because they think yes. they do a mistake and recommend some waiting yes. 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 and during yes. that time a metastasis a metastatic process is going on and we don't sleep well with that idea so we think we have to do something earlier that would really calm us down if we would know a number how many patients do have actually have during that regrowth phase also a metastatic spread i think that's an important if we would have that number very, very pleased to get it, and I, I know this would answer many questions here. Um, these are my burning questions. I will assure you some others. Uh, I don't know uh, in the room here. Yes, Andrea, she's a surgeon, and uh, yes. Yes, hello, uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much for sharing the data. Um, you mentioned uh, that you wait in a tumor persistence up to six months. Yes. Um, do you wait in certain circumstances even longer, or is that your deadline? No, uh, because obviously I've been doing this for 30 years. And uh, in uh, some people suggest, well, like Habagama say that you can wait longer. But now uh, uh, Rodrigo, who is a younger uh, member of her team, is saying that uh, at six months you should start thinking seriously about what next to do. So you don't have to do TME for all patients. I shared the data with the local excision. So persistent tumor, you can still do local excision, but you have to do full thickness, really. Uh, and then obviously, you know, if, if you feel uncomfortable <coughs> that, that doing a lo lo uh, local excision, then obviously you do the TME surgery. But at that point, before you actually do it, you must get histological confirmation of invasive cancer, that's very important. Because I showed you one of the, in one of the slides, 40% of patients who had local excision in external beam alone arm, there is no residual tumor at all. So although you see something growing, or like, like my last patient, there's something popped up and I was worried, but it was my surgeon who hold my hand and said, no, no, it's soft, I'll just take it out and see what happened. And that was just a, you know, no evidence of malignancy in the histology. It was saved by the bell, actually. Does that answer your question? Kind of a step up approach. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. So, and. So, and so the local treatment they do, as you said just before, it's coming back with a regrowth, is a local TM attempt. It's yeah. not the TME yeah. normally. You can either do TAMS or TAMS, but people are go moving away from TAMS now. The, 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 the Wolf company that makes TAM is no longer making it. So there's another company called Stock, which makes a small, smaller version of TAMS. And now you can do TAMS, you know, if, if you're a laparoscopic surgeon, you, sh you should be able to do that. But some people don't like doing it if it is very low in anterior. Usually the ones Mike Hirschman like to do is to higher up posterior are easy because you're into you're not into the peritoneal cavity. And if they're lateral, depending on how far lateral they are. So from about three to six, seven o'clock, uh, he would be uh, quite happy to do uh, full thickness excision. But you do need histological evidence before you actually do uh, uh, DME surgery. Yeah, that's that's was also impressive. This forty percent of, you know, finally uh, no tumor in the TEM resection. Correct. Correct. That's so, that thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, for me a very uh, uh, important talk you're doing here, and for us it's answering a lot of questions. We probably will still have some very. Um, it's a difficult case, which we're going to uh, discuss a lot. And uh, there we, um, yeah, we will might come back to you if possible. I don't know, Saskia, you had a case you discussed a lot here. Do you want to briefly present that? We had a lot of discussion. Um, Hi, I'm Saskia. I'm an oncologist with Daniel. Um, I'm very grateful having you here. It's it's a special uh, honor to have someone here who's really a, a professor with a high achievement in organ preservation. And it's, it's surely something we should do in the future, and we should find the right patients to do that. 
I had one special patient, which we always, you know, discuss in almost every tumor board here. It was a special case. It was a 43-year-old patient with a rectal cancer, 23 millimeters from the anal cutaneous uh, line. Um, it was a T4 and N2 um, N0 at this time, um, CRM positive MY3. Um, so um, a very um, long tumor with seven centimeters um, spreading uh, distance. Um, um, it was an ugly tumor, like you uh, said before, and um, we knew that would be difficult. Um, we performed TNT um, and staged him um, actually three months after the end of radio uh, therapy or the radio chemotherapy, not after um, the last eight cycles of Folfox. Um, and we found um, a little odd ulcer in the end. We've did not very much experience at the time, I have to say. We didn't know exactly how the ulcers look like. After this time, we had another patient. We compared it with that um, and it seemed different. Um, so we did the bad thing. We biopsy at this time and we found a lot of vital cells. What we did then, we decided to watch and wait because he wanted to move um, to Singapore to perform a later uh, staging three months after the uh, first staging because we had a complete remission in all other pictures. Um, and what we found then, or what the colleagues now in Singapore found, um, had been um, hepatic metastasis. So oh. the hepatic metastasis had been there already. We, we looked it up. Uh, retrospectively, they've been there um, at least from July, uh, 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 January uh, 2024, which was um, three months after radio chemotherapy. So these metastases seem to grow under chemotherapy, um, chemo radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, this is something special which we rarely see, I have to say, and this is, I think, your opinion too. Um, but what is your opinion about, in this case, especially about chemotherapy resistance? Or can you um, figure out or um, have an idea of what is the reason why we? didn't respond um, uh, in the liver and why we still had, even after three times papillon in between, um, still vital cells in the uh, rectal ulcer at this time. Yeah, obviously, you know, we don't cure everybody with papillon. And I always say that to the patients that, you know, there's no guarantee for cure. Or when I write a letter to patient, the standard of care is doing surgery that will give you the best chance of cure we can give you papillon to improve local control, but there's no guarantee for cure. You need to understand that. And if there is a residual tumor or a regrowth, you must go for surgery. So that's always in my statement. So that's what you have to do. You have to turn that into patient's head. And in your patient information sheets, you know, you have to write that. We don't always write about the metastatic disease. Uh, you're right to raise that, actually. But we don't see a lot of metastatic disease um, in our patients. And we're looking at the immune response after contact. And that's one of the research that we are doing in Liverpool to see why we see so little uh, 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 metastatic disease. So we, we felt that it's not just the function of dose, which is quite high. The, the BED for this is six times higher than uh, 45 or 50 gray. Uh, the, the, what, what we give is about 300 equivalent of uh, of the external beam dose. And still, there are some uh, tumor uh, clones are quite uh, uh, resistant to treatment. And again, that's one of the areas that we want to try and find out why these clones are so resistant to radiation. So you can't expect to cure everybody, obviously. And, and obviously, there are persistent clones in at least 10 20% of our cohort, you know, of the patients that we treated. And obviously, the, most of them end up having surgery. But do you think this patient should have had an operation? Uh, um, no. no. <laughs> there was a lot of debate about that in, in one of the meetings, actually, I, I was in. Uh, uh, and, 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 and Nice, actually, Rosa Gerard Richard and all the world experts were invited. And I was there presenting my quality of life data, and and they were saying that should we should the patient should have should have surgery, but even if you have surgery and you 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 know from your surgical experience that they can still have metastatic disease because these are 
the spread from the beginning micrometastases, which is harboring either in the lungs or liver, and, and they grow. Even after surgery, they, you can still have metastatic disease. Uh, lymphovascular invasion is now known to be uh, 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 to be uh, the important features. If you see this lymphovascular invasion, then these patients are likely to to, to, to relapse in future rather than the lymph nodes. So but you have two factors, really, multiple lymph nodes and the lymphovascular uh, uh, in, invasion uh, features. So when you see that, that's one thing. The other thing is after chemo radiation, if there is persistent of uh, suspicious lymph nodes, that's one of the very bad uh, prognostic factors. And when you see that in young fit patients, then the recommendation is to follow them up quite closely. Because as you know, nowadays, metastatic disease is no longer a death threat now. If they go and deliver one, two, three, four, five, doesn't matter. They can still resect them and they can do a lot of things, SBRT, radiofrequency ablation. And in the lungs, you know, we, we do all sorts of things. And I, I have many patients I can show you with, with multiple meds who survive 10, 15 years now, even though they develop metastatic disease, it's not the death uh, warrant for them anymore like we have in the past. So the hepatobiliary surgeons are very good. The, uh, the pulmonary surgeons are very good resecting them. And we can do radiofrequency ablation. We can do SABER. I'm sure Christina would be interested. And you have to give these choice to patient, really. And then with the chemo, again, you know, if you know the gene profile, you can give them, uh, you know, the appropriate uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, you know, which, which are now very, very powerful now. Okay, but you know, this patient has had an aggressive disease after three months after radiotherapy, just ending the systemic therapy, uh, he had these still viable cells on the biopsy, and we discussed heavily. We didn't know that he got will have metastasis in the liver. We didn't know that. Yeah, but then, we knew he had an aggressive disease. And three months after that, we found those cells and we knew we shouldn't have biopsy. You can say, you know, you should not do a biopsy after three months. But yeah. I mean, with those findings, would you have said, you know, this is an aggressive biology. Most likely this patient will need a local treatment, which is more effective than what we can offer or have offered so far. And he should go to surgery right away. Even if he does do metastasis to the liver, we can deal with that later, but he will benefit from this local definitive treatment would you have said this is should have been said and recommended or do you still think yes we can wait another three months no no uh, no no so every time at, at every stage three months six months you have to discuss with patients you know what 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 did they want out of their life you know because my son-in-law i'm sad to say he was only 43 and he died uh, from rectal cancer with liver meds from the beginning, he had bilobar mats. There are 12 mats, 10, millimeter, 10 centimeters, actually. And then I told him from the beginning, you, you, I can't cure your cancer. And he said, I don't care what you do. I do not want surgery. I do not want a stoma. I'm going to die anyway. And he lived for about three years, you know. So you've got to discuss with the patient honestly. And then you have to say that, my, in my opinion, you should have surgery. What do you say? And patient may say, I don't care I, if I die, you know, I don't want a stoma. So they, they make a decision. You have to stress that, you know, um, that, that they have got the aggressive disease. But you would have said at three months time with the positive cells, you would have said this patient should be recommended surgery. No, not at three months. No, no, not at three months. Because they, they, when, you, when you take biopsies, what happens is you're taking a superficial layer of the mucosa. And after irradiation, all these cells look abnormal. So in our medical school, you know, um, Christina and I know that after radiation, we don't take biopsies on the cervix, carcinoma cervix. If you take biopsies on carcinoma cervix, which treated with radiation, you always see abnormal cells. You will always see abnormal cells. Just because you see abnormal cells doesn't mean that he's got a cancer in, in this specimen. So thank you very much. Yes, this was uh, part of our intensive discussion. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so no, it's a very questions. good discussion. And I said to this company, the girl, I was talking to Gina, 
that when we have cases, I'm very happy to join in your discussion. You know, I can do it online anytime because Christina officially do that with me anyway. So she'll just ring me or send me a uh, send me an email uh, and then we discuss it. So when you have interesting cases, I'm very happy to join in. You know, th uh, Tuesdays are good for me and this time is fine. I usually, uh, you know, I'm at home and I can join in anytime. Very happy to discuss cases with you. But if you set up uh, the watch and wait clinic, that could be something, you know, because obviously you, you, you got a lot of experience and you, you do run it properly. And this could be a international referral center for, for, for difficult patients, you know, and then we can discuss it. And I can get my, my mentor, Jean-Pierre Gerard, to join in. And you can, you can give a very, very good opinion to these patients around the world, actually. That, that would be absolutely marvelous, marvelous, because we really want to do this. We want to go ahead and, and be this yeah. reference center here in Zurich. And, yeah. and, you know, we are looking for these experiences and for these cases. We, we are having them already. We are already having the questions and we're having the dedicated team here also to do it. Yeah. And yeah. we are keen to go ahead. And yeah. uh, we we're really pleased if you could join us on difficult cases. Oh, oh, very, 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 very happy. Just send me an email uh, and I'll do it through this uh, company. And then I'll be very happy to, to join in. But the important thing is to keep a data, data. I'm, I'm sure you all are very precise people and got, got funding for it. So keep a, a record of everything that you've done. So in years to come, then you'll be able to look back and you can you can tell others that, you know, this is what you should be doing. And I'm very, very happy to uh, join in with these discussions. Yeah, we are entering the data also. We publish, as a, I mean, Christina is about to publish a, a series. We are entering into the International Watch and Wait database, so the old data. So, yes, uh, we, we, we surely have to do also the quality uh, assessments uh, that going right. on. And quality yes. of life and cost effectiveness and all these sort of things, really. Yeah. Uh, and the patient's choice, you know, this is the other thing. So you need to talk to them make them understand this is not a standard treatment, but still others may choose to die, you know, as I said in my cartoon, you know, they rather die than have a bag. And th there are a lot of people, when Papillon fails, I have to talk to the patient and some of them are very fit patients, you know, these are SAS, you know, soldiers, six foot seven. They said, I can't live with this. And then, you know, I have to sit and watch him grow, the tumor grows and he had metastasized and he died, you know, and my son-in-law is the same, you know, he he never had a local uh, recruit. His was a T4 N2 tumor, primary tumor. Luckily, he responded to external beam chemo radiation and some neurogevin chemo. And I have to take him to Nice to my mentor, Jean-Pierre Gerard, because I, I don't have the heart to treat him. So he had three psych, uh, shots of papillon. And this big tumor never came back, actually. Um, and it was good for him because he, he would not agree to have surgery. So we have to make patients understand and go to respect what, what they say. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know, uh, Christina, you have a question? No, I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andy, thank you. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to hear tonight is that you don't have to biopsy after three months. Yeah. <laughs> and if the virus is positive after three months and you yeah. have a clinical complete response, at least on what you feel on the finger or what you see on the scope, yeah. you can still wait three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, but, to the but, question, Bernie, the EBV database published this early this year an update and yeah. they showed that actually if you made a second assessment, a good yeah. portion of the patients that are in real complete response. Yeah. Three months after achieved complete response. Yeah. And actually, we have a higher risk of metastasis if you have a local relapse and you don't react to local relapse. So if the tumor is still there and you don't do nothing, of course, the patient has more chance to have a metastasis later on. But if you react on the after six months, after six months, and the growth in total, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the, the, the data from parents. Yeah. Yeah, well, you must always have full discussion with the patient and document what has what been agreed, you know. They need to understand the risk that they're taking, and there are people who will take the risk and rather than have surgery. But the majority will agree to have surgery, and that's good. But even if you have surgery, and our data said, you know, they still have distant matches afterwards. 